Hi there. If you're anything like me, a 20 year old terminally online e-boy, we probably had a pretty similar childhood, playing a copious amount of video games in a dark room. That means that you went through the same dry spell between 2015 and well, today, where games have gradually gotten worse. A constant in life is that things will change, but it's not always for the better. The gaming industry is no exception to this rule and has gradually morphed from something profitable for passionate devs who want to deliver to their fans, to squeezing out every possible dollar from the audience. But where did it all start? Who were the pioneers of ruining gaming? Why does every game released today feel exactly the same? Today, I, V Plasma, am going to answer these questions. Let's get into it. In 2013, Valve would release one of the most influential updates of all time, the arms deal update for Counter-Strike Global Offensive. This update released the first weapon case as well as a few collections of skins. It should be noted that Valve's first time using this system was back in 2010 with Team Fortress 2, but as we'll soon see in this video, CSGO's market was far more popular. At first, these skins weren't much, but if you know literally anything about CSGO's skin market today, you'll know this picked up eventually. The Karambit Fade out of the first weapon case at the time was worth $70, today it is worth $2,000. The rarity and uniqueness aspect of skins drive it to be very popular in the community and Valve would continue releasing cases, with the community buying them in mass every time. This included YouTubers who would do case opening videos, which was a huge hit in the YouTube CSGO community. Some of CSGO's biggest names came from this era, like Anomaly and Mick Skillet, and the views they pulled were definitely nothing to scoff at. Who knew there was such a big market for watching people waste a ton of money? Oh, right. <laughs> Silly me. As the market kept growing and skins got more expensive, it was made very clear to certain people that CSGO's skin market held a massive opportunity for financial gain. But how would they turn Counter-Strike skins into a profitable business? Enter CSGO Gambling Sites To say these websites took off would be the understatement of the century. The profitability of these websites can't be overstated and the measures to which those would go to ensure the operations went as smoothly as possible were nothing short of laughable. While these sites have definitely fallen off in today's age, back in 2015 and 2016, they were everywhere, constantly financed by the massive deposit of skins as well as sponsorship by YouTubers. These sites were so successful due to the aforementioned sponsorships drawing in a massive audience, as well as how easy these sites were to access and use. All you would need to do is link your Steam account. That's it. No ID, and if you were so young that you didn't even have a debit card yet, it was perfectly fine since CSGO skins were the main currency. Valve did eventually start to take these websites down and ban their trade bots, some of which held hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of skins. Seeing this, most site owners pulled out their assets and shut down, before losing everything. Now, why did I just tell you all of this? What does CSGO have to do with anything happening today? Well, let's do a quick recap. A paid case is released containing a number of items and different rarities, which then becomes a flourishing market through influencers. People become obsessed and even addicted to these cases. And in the wildest turn of events, gambling turns out to be a massive hit, even with children, who somehow had all the money to gamble. Now, imagine yourself as a AAA executive watching some random nobody teenager start a multi-million dollar business overnight using these fictional boxes and weapon skins. It was their turn to capitalize. What is it gonna be? Get yeah, legendary! Right. No, it's a Soldier 76 skin! Enter the loot box era. What used to be only for the most diehard fans of mobile games was now the main content system in AAA releases. The list of games that had loot boxes in them was rapidly expanding. While most games were cosmetic only, some games dabbled in a cardinal sin of gaming. Pay to win. Halo 5 and Star Wars Battlefront 2, for example, would use a loot box system to reward the player with in-game modifiers. Boxes in general would also be filled to the brim with duplicates. Halo 5 was also one of the many games to use a very bright and loud open animation to release as much dopamine as possible. This was intended to give the user a higher chance of becoming addicted to the loot boxes. 
While I shouldn't downplay the severity of a loot box addiction, I will say, how did anybody enjoy hearing this, let alone over and over again? As scummy as loot boxes were, they were extremely profitable. Games beforehand would cost $60 or so, with a few paid DLC here and there. But now, games would cost their base price, as well as have a recurring option for customers to pay, spending more than they ever would have on DLC. It was also much less dev work, as instead of making these massive maps or events, you would just make cosmetics and throw them into a weapon case. The loot box trend continued until literally every single game you played would have one in it. Even single player games, like Middle Earth Shadow of War, one of my personal all-time favorites. But, but you know what, you know what, I forgive you, I forgive you Shadow of War. It did not take long for people to get tired of loot boxes, and anytime somebody like Yang Ye would post a video about them, everybody would flock to his comments to see then his replies. Occasionally, the backlash of loot boxes did work and companies would backpedal on their decisions. For example, Shadow of War completely removed its loot boxes, and 24 hours before launch, Star Wars Battlefront 2 made them unpurchasable. And other games implemented systems to help with the duplicate item issue or just gave the boxes better loot to begin with because I'm sure it was too difficult to do that at the very beginning. EA backpedaling on its loot boxes was a testament that voting with your wallet definitely works. While EA was milking their audience in every title with things like FIFA Ultimate Team Packs, Battlefront 2 was the straw that broke the camel's back for a lot of people, eventually leading to a court case in 2019, where they would spit out the now infamous line of, they aren't loot boxes, they're surprise mechanics. We look at it as as surprise mechanics. What I said is I think the way we've implemented our FIFA Ultimate Team Packs is ethical. Fuck. You know, I wish I was this good at taking no accountability for my actions. This court case to a lot of people was the unofficial death of loot boxes. While they would be present in games from this point onwards, they were no longer the addiction-powered money machine they used to be. No, 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 no. This was 2019, and there was a new kid on the block to copy. You see, there was one game that would reshape the industry that I've avoided mentioning to this point, because the level at which this game changed the industry can't be overstated. In July of 2017, Fortnite would be released, and in the year 2018, it would rake in 5.4 billion dollars. Dude, what the fuck? Fortnite, while it did ride the Battle Royale trend, did something different, combining player attention and financial contribution into one system. The Battle Pass was born. Fortnite was a huge success on Arrival and easily cemented itself into the industry with very healthy player counts. It also made a lot of money. You see, Fortnite wasn't a trend follower. While it was a battle royale game riding on that trend at the time, it took itself much less seriously than the other games, like PUBG and H1Z1. People would give it a try and then be introduced to its very unique business model. This consisted of the item shop and the battle pass. The shop has changed a lot over the years, but for the most part, the battle pass has stayed the same. That was only part of Fortnite's business model though, as it really relied on something called FOMO, the fear of missing out. Every item in Fortnite was subjected to be limited time, and it was never known when or if they would come back. Some items have been gone for years, and the battle pass items, those never come back, period. FOMO plays into the fear of somebody wanting something and not being able to obtain it. So when they see that one item that they've wanted for months finally in the shop, they don't care what the price is and will usually never think twice. It's a pretty genius way of incentivizing your audience to pay. Fortnite would healthily keep growing and the culture inside the game would expand. This would expand so much to the point where people who have never even looked at Fortnite knew what a golden scar was. Its success was undeniable at this point and everybody knew about the game. Just as a quick reminder, we're around the 2018 to 2019 mark right now, where loot boxes were still here but were in decline as anti-gambling laws were being brought into question. While Fortnite was living large in its own bubble, other companies were trying to find ways to jump ship safely. They didn't really care that audiences hated loot boxes, they were more concerned at the fact that the backlash was legitimately making them lose a lot of money. Like clockwork, as soon as Fortnite's success was determined to not be a fluke and its 2018 earnings were reported on, people immediately began to change their business models to match it. 
At first, games try to be somewhat original to avoid copyright lawsuits by giving their own twist on the idea and giving it a different name. But other companies were so shamelessly greedy for part of Epic Games' success that most eventually just gave up and named it The Battle Pass, with a generic 100 tier challenge based XP system. Remember in the intro how I said that every game feels exactly the same? This is where that came from. Whether you think Fortnite is good or bad, you can't deny its success. You also can't deny that it's one of the biggest reasons why the industry is in shambles right now, as it indirectly caused everybody to desperately try to be the next version of itself. But none of these games have gotten even remotely close. This trend of copying Fortnite went on and on, and it still is happening today. But that's not the end of our story, as there is a little bit more to it than just trend chasing. You see, back in 2016, gaming companies had a choice. A choice that would either maximize the benefit of the consumers, or the company. In August of 2016, an absolute dumpster fire of a game called No Man's Sky was released. Most of you probably already know the story of this game. One of the most ambitious projects of all time, releasing on a throne of lies and bugs. But did you know the game still turned a profit? Yeah, this turned a profit. In the first month, while Hello Games made the absolute Sigma move of using all of that money to properly develop the game instead of pulling a CSGO gambling site, it was an interesting situation, to say the least. And once again in 2018, another absolute train wreck of a game was released called Fallout 76, and that game also turned a profit just by being part of a popular IP. It was released in such a bad state, it straight up bricked some people's computers. Update after update was released, slowly patching the game into a playable state, and Bethesda making a ton of money in the process. They were doing some very shady monetary practices during the lifespan of the game, such as giving their own products 5 star reviews so people would buy them, giving false price markdowns on items, which is straight up illegal in some parts of the world by the way, among other things. There are more cases of this kind of thing happening, but I think you get the point. Games with awful releases were still managing to turn a profit. Now, I might be reaching here, and you can tell me if I am, but I think companies saw this and realized that as long as they make the game sound bigger and better than ever, it'll make decent money, as long as they skimp out on development. It took throwing away morality to unlock the true profitability of games, no longer looking at your fans as well. Fans and instead looking at them as walking talking bundles of money. While this would be directly lying to the very people who looked up to them, at this point, do you think they cared? This culminated around 2020 where the stereotypical live service game was created. I'm obligated to define live service, so I will. A live service game is a game that is released with the intention of being updated over time, rather than being released as a finished product. Rainbow Six Siege, Overwatch, Apex Legends, Fortnite, Destiny, you get it. This led down a path of corporations constantly testing which boundaries they could cross, and the line would be drawn further and further every time they let us down, driving us to the point where people were actually defending Halo Infinite and Battlefield 2042. I saved this piece for last because it's more of a recent thing and it's not exactly deserving of an entire chapter, but the hard truth is that none of these corporations care about you, or anyone who plays their games, or the games themselves. The only thing that they care for and are paid to care for is that that shop and battle pass purchase button work. That puts money in their pockets. The previous tier is only going to get worse the more time goes on. It's happened as recently as Overwatch 2. Nothing is too far for these guys. Microsoft turned the number one game in the world into a shameless cash grab that can't even pull 5,000 concurrent players. These greedy corporations like Ubisoft, EA, Microsoft, Activision Blizzard, they're doing this and getting away with it because they know they can. And the only way to stop it is to completely stop buying their products. And with a market as big as video games, that's all but impossible. Like I said earlier, voting with your wallet definitely works, and hitting EA where it hurt during that time is definitely what made loot boxes go in the decline. But with FOMO being so effective, who knows if it'll work again.
I hope I did a good job with this. This is my first video essay, and it's such a long spanning issue, making it this condensed was really hard. This was fun though, and complaining about the gaming industry is something I'm really passionate about, so expect more from me very soon. Subscribe if you want more from me, like the video if you liked it, dislike if you didn't. I've been Vplasma, and I'll see you next time I complain about something. Take care.